Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure for me to welcome you this afternoon to the beautiful Gustavianum at Uppsala University, to the Faculty of Theology and to the lectures of this year's Honorary Doctors in Theology. My name is Matthias Martinsson. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Theology here in Uppsala. This afternoon will be divided in three separate 45-minute sessions uh, with 10 to 15 minutes break between them. It is, of course, one session for each of our three speakers, our honorary doctors, Laurie Beeman, Sidney White Crawford, and Elaine Scarry. We are so proud that you are among us today. You are most welcome. A more detailed presentation of the honorary doctors will take place in the beginning of each each section where they uh, perform. And after each lecture, there is an opportunity for at least one or two questions from uh, the audience. This first hour, we concentrate on our first speaker, Laurie Beeman, who is professor of uh, religious diversity and social change, social change at the University of Ottawa, Canada. Professor Beeman is an internationally renowned scholar who, among many other things, has written extensively on the effects of globalization and migration on Western societies with a Christian tradition and heritage. Her research is multidisciplinary and engaged in many fields, such as sociology of religion, law, feminist theory, ethics, etc. Among Professor Beeman's books, we find the recent monograph, Deep Equality in an Era of Diversity, from 2017. Another monograph is uh, Defining Harm, Religious Freedom and the Limits of Law from 2008. She has co-edited a number of volumes, one with the title Atheist Identities, Spaces and Social Context 2015. The latest among the impressive number of scholarly articles in journals is a recent text, Living Well Together in a non-religious future or religious future, depending on how you uh, interpret the title. This is published in the journal, journal Sociology of Religion 2017. Professor Beeman is also international advisor to the research program Impact of Religion, hosted by the Department of Theology here at Uppsala University. And in 2017, she got the Canada Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Insight Award for her work within the framework of her concept, Deep Equality. Professor Beeman, it's a true honor for the Faculty of Theology to have you here in Uppsala this week. And we are now all eager to hear more about your own research. Once again, welcome. The floor is yours. There. It's on? How is it? Good? Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an incredible honor to be here. Um, I have now seen the ring that comes with this, and I've realized that I'm actually marrying uh, Uppsala University, which is a little scary for me. Um, it means a, a deep commitment, which I take very seriously, uh, including probably not being able to say no to any invitation that comes to, <laughs> from my colleagues here. So uh, it's, a, it's an incredible honor, and thank you so much to all of you. So today, I'm wanting to talk, the title of my talk is The New Diversity, Complex Futures and Deep Equality. And I'll go straight to the answer. So if you, you know, want to just leave and go have a coffee while I talk, that's fine. But it, the future includes both the religious and the non-religious. I'm not thinking religion is going anywhere anytime soon. So today, I, want, I have four goals in this talk. The first, I want to suggest that a new diversity has emerged that requires new research methods, uh, different research approaches, and new approaches in civil society. Uh, this is not, I'm not the only one arguing this, so it's, but I'll have a, a particular take on the new diversity and I'll review that first. The second thing I'd like to do is explore some examples from the healthcare setting. 
I don't usually work in healthcare, but I happen to be involved in a few projects right now that involve the healthcare setting. And I think there is some interesting unfolding of the new diversity, specifically in healthcare. So I'll talk about that a little bit. The third thing I'd like to do is explore with you two models that I see unfolding in conversations about this. Um, and then the fourth thing I'd like to do is reflect for a moment on how people I think are already engaging in living well together. And that's going to come back to this notion of deep equality, which I won't talk a lot about, but I will talk a little bit about it. So the new diversity, the new, and I don't have any PowerPoint, by the way. Um, so you really now have to either get the coffee or pay attention. Um, so there are four pieces to this new diversity I'm talking about, and I'm specifically thinking about religion here. So there are other pieces to what people might call new diversity or super diversity, but I'm, I'm focusing a bit on religion or non-religion, and that's where I'm starting. So some new developments around diversity are changing the nature and shape of what we describe as the public sphere. This have, this feels like it has a bit of feedback. Do you want me to move it a bit? There, better? Okay, all right. Um, so first, during the past decade, something rather phenomenal has happened in a number of Western democracies. For the first time ever, census data and population, population surveys show that a critical mass of people are non-religious, identifying as none when asked their religion. N-O-N-E, -E, not N-U-N. I gave a talk about non-religion in a Catholic hospital a while ago, and I had to really emphasize that when you say none. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, here, I'm probably a little safer. Um, so 24% of Canadians, for example, self-describe as nuns or non-religious, according to the most recent data available from StatsCan. And this figure is up from 16.5% in 2001. Canada is like many other countries in its increasing nun population. It's increasing rather rapidly. In many cases, the increase has been by 20% over only a few decades. Uh, other examples include the United States, which is showing at about 20% now. Australia has new data out, 30.1% of people identify as non-religious. The UK is over 50%, 50.6% uh, according to one uh, set of data I've looked at. France, 28%, the Czech Republic, 76.4%, Estonia, 596 and Sweden, 27%. And I was speaking with Mia Lofheim yesterday about some of her research on non-religion, and she says that the, the figure in Sweden amongst youth is much higher, uh, that 27% is a fairly conservative estimate. The non-religious constitute a growing presence in a wide range of social, economic, and cultural contexts. More importantly though, non-religion or being a nun has moved from being a marginal category to being one which represents a legitimate position or identification. The nun category is made up of a wide range of worldviews, ranging from atheist, humanist, spiritual but not religious, and those who are quite simply indifferent. To date, this group remains understudied. Just a note on terminology, we still don't really know what to call this group, um, what, which is made up of, as I said, a diverse range of people, atheists, agnostics, humanists, indifference, nuns, or non-religious. My least fav favorite is non-believers, which we still hear. Um, and that, those are all placeholders for a group whose contours we don't fully understand. Although this is changing um, somewhat rapidly, given the research that people are doing, inc including uh, Mia Löfheim, also uh, Anders uh, Holboy, uh, Swede. This is one of my commitments, being married to the University of Uppsala is I'm going to have to improve my Swedish. Um, so one of the problems of non-belief is that there, with the term non-belief is that there's an implication that the non-religious don't have beliefs. Often that's extended to that they don't have values or morals and underlying all of that is a tussle about the roots of morality and values and a moral panic over a godless world that seems to be on the horizon. So that's the first piece of the new diversity. The second piece is a decline in institutional religion. So as we might expect, there's a simultaneous change um, and that there has been, a, with the increase of the non-religious, and that there's been a rapid decline in uh, commitment to organized religion. Now here I think it's necessary to mention the work of Grace Davey, who I'm no, I know uh, quite a number of you know, um, and her work specifically on vic vicarious religion and believing without belonging. And Grace essentially, this is a, a very simplified version of Grace's work, but um, she essentially argues that there's a small group of people who are performing religion for the rest of us who might not necessarily want to participate. So they're doing particular work for us. 
Uh, Grace just has a special connection to Uppsala University as well, and I'm honored to be in the same company as her. I think the important point here is that this lack of commitment is complicated, and it's not um, clear exactly what the non-committed are doing. It's not that they're unaffiliated, it's that they're really not committed. Many of them are not identifying as non-religious, Many of them still identify with a religious tradition. In Sweden, that's about 65% of people, and in Canada, it's about the same. The percentages are about almost identical. But many are not supporting the churches in tangible ways. And this results, among other things, in an abundance of church buildings available for condominium development. I don't know if that happens here or not. Are churches transitioning to condominiums here? No, this is happening in, in North America perhaps more than um, so condominiums, uh, I'm doing some research with a postdoctoral fellow named uh, Monica Gregori in Montreal, and we're looking at the transition of spaces. So for example, one of the things that we see there, uh, a gray nuns convent transformed into a university residence uh, and study area. Um, in fact, I taught, when I taught at Concordia, I taught in the convent. The, the transition was just happening then, so I was teaching in a classroom that had uh, crucifixes and various other uh, religious paraphernalia on the walls and in the hallways as I entered the building. Um, we also see a church converted to a senior's home, an Orthodox and Catholic group sharing the same church space because neither can afford their own churches, um, and maybe I might say not too happily sharing the same space, and in, but recognizing that they need each other, so they have to share the space. An increasingly prevalent architectural figure in, this, in uh, cities uh, or city developments is the remnants of a church building incorporated into a new development, so you'll see uh, in Montreal, this is quite common, a, a, a wall of a, of a former church that's been sort of folded around with modern architecture. So there's some kind of idea that one should preserve some piece of this architecture uh, or remnant of the history or, or heritage. Uh, as rural populations decline, once vibrant country churches are closing, and of course, coming with all of this are feelings of loss. Uh, there are amalgamations of congregations, debates about who should amalgamate, um, which churches should be clo essentially closed down and sold off. So this is happening quite frequently, actually. So this is the second piece of the new diversity. Uh, this group who, are com who have an affiliation but aren't really committing in any tangible way. The third piece is the acceleration of migration. So the third change is an acceleration of migration, often to the same countries in which the number of non-religious has increased so dramatically and rapidly. Migrant groups often bring with them religious practices and traditions that, while present in the receiving country, have been largely unnoticed or under the radar. Um, they've just been small, small pieces of the population. In Canada, between 2001 and 2011, the percentage of those who identify as Hindus, Sikh, Buddhist, and Muslim increased from 4.9 to 7.2, which might not seem like a lot, but it's an increase in visibility and, and bodies, if you will. Um, and this group accounted for 33% of immigrants who arrived within that 10-year period. Australia has a steady increase of the same groups, with Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims increased from 3.9% of the population in 2001 to 6% in 2011. In the UK, something similar from 5% to 7.5% between 2001 and 2011. And according to Statistics Sweden, as of 2016, 17.65% of the population is foreign born. In Canada, it's around 21.45% of the population is foreign born. The statistics are similar in many Western democracies. With increased numbers, often come increased, comes increased public visibility. Migration and its entanglement with religion is, of course, nothing new. Uh, there's a long history of this. There's a long history of migration related to religion, religious issues, in various ways from a range of groups and for a range of reasons, including Jews, Muslims, radical Protestants, Hindus, and Mormons. So that's the third piece. The fourth piece indigenous populations. So there's a renewed attention to indigenous populations and their treatment. For Canada, religion has played a key role in the attempted annihilation of indigenous culture, which was characterized as essentially savage. 
Indigenous children were taken from their families to residential schools, and this began in the 1800s. They were forbidden to speak their language. They were forbidden to communicate with each other, even if they were siblings. Um, they were often physically and sexually abused. Their own spiritual practices were forbidden, and Christianization was very much part of the civilizing of indigenous peoples. We can make some comparisons with the Swedish Lutheran Church and the Sami. Um, and as is the case here, Canada's indigenous peoples have been active in the courts in an attempt to protect their culture, heritage, and spiritualities. In Canada, a government commission called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I believe there was a similar commission in Australia, resulted in 94 calls to action, which are specific directives to facilitate reconciliation. There has in part, this has in part resulted in an increased attention to indigenous spiritualities, which are present in indigenous law, environmental action, and language. So, all of these factors mean that Canada, and that's where I always sort of start thinking, Canada's becoming increasingly religiously and non-religiously diverse. But this is also the case for many Western democracies, including Sweden. And I, of course, don't pretend to understand Sweden as well as I understand, I hope, Canada, but I have colleagues who do. This is not a change in kind, but a change in degree. But as scholars like Steve Vertovac argue, and he's developed this notion of super diversity, degree matters. In this era of new diversity, there's a renegotiation happening in a number of areas. And I'll mention a couple today. Assisted death, public practices like prayer and religious symbols, and so on. And in order to achieve inclusion and equality, this renegotiation is in fact necessary. What's clear is that this shifting ground has the potential to create increased conflict, platforms for exclusion, and feelings of voicelessness in the public sphere. New tools in social science are required. More subtle measures of religion and non-religion, as well as a deeper understanding of identity rigidity and identity fluidity. So I'd like to now let you listen to me drink some water. It's kind of hard to do with this thing on. Um, I'd like to now turn to this notion of the impact of the new diversity. And looking at the healthcare settings that I've been working in, one of those settings is related to a project on prayer in healthcare, believe it or not. Um, and that project is co-led by Cheryl Reimer Kirkham and Sonia Sharma. Cheryl's at Trinity Western University in British Columbia, uh, and Sonia is based in England. Uh, right at the, she used to be in Durham, but I think she shifted. Um, and we have sites in Vancouver and in London, England. The Vancouver site is a publicly funded Catholic health authority, and there we've interviewed 51 spiritual care providers, administrators, healthcare providers, and volunteers. So I'll focus on this Catholic hospital in Vancouver just for a few moments to reflect on the new diversity and its impact on healthcare provision. I'll start with this, this uh, particular hospital. So there were five sites in Vancouver all related to the Catholic health authority. The hospital is situated in downtown Vancouver. If any of you have been in downtown Vancouver, you can you know that it's uh, there are places that are a little bit we might call them sketchy, um, don't feel necessarily especially safe, and the hospital is located somewhat near to that. It's uh, it serves a, a very urban population. It's a walk-in place for people with drug addictions. The hospital is known for its work on HIV. Um, but from a physical space perspective, it's interesting to think about the impact of the new diversity I described above. The hospital contains, as you might expect, a chapel which is, in my view, to put it bluntly, very Catholic. There's a crucifix, somber blue carpet, matching chairs, a marble table, flowers, candles, religious artifacts, and so on. In another area of the hospital, there's the meditation room. And that room contains a compass to indicate the direction of Mecca and a large poster-sized photograph of some kind of nature-y tree scene. The room is intended to offer a space to a range of users, obviously from Buddhist to Muslim and non-religious, those who want a quiet place. There's an additional room that's big, beautiful, and spacious. It's called the All Nations Sacred Room, or Sacred Space. 
It's intended for use by indigenous peoples. It has a beautiful Haida-inspired carpet, warm wood floors, indigenous art, and cupboards filled with medicines, meaning sacred herbs that are essential for sacred or um, indigenous ritual. It might interest you to know that the space is equipped with large fans, and the reason for that is that it's the only area in the house, or in the house, in the hospital, where you're actually allowed to burn things. They have an exemption. Um, I want to include a fourth space in my description, and that is the garden. And the garden is on an upper floor of the hospital, so it's a kind of walkout area. Unfortunately, at the time I saw the garden, it was looking by a gardener's standards, a little bit sad. Um, they had been in the middle of a bit of a drought, but there were a couple of beds that were full of very lush looking vegetables. And I include this fourth space because I suspect that there are people for whom the somewhat sparse and what I might describe as even as a con the confused space of the meditation room would not meet their needs in a way that the garden space would. Rachel Brown, a postdoctoral fellow who worked on this project, noted that one of the people she interviewed saw the garden space as sacred space in a different way. And she's written a blog on uh, smoking as a sacred ritual. This person, this interviewee said, and this is a quote, I did bring you out, out to the smoking area in the garden and that for me, I mean, I see people out there and they're on their own and they're, you know, stuff is, stuff is going through their heads when they're out there. They're going through something when they're out there. To my mind, that's almost like a place of prayer, end quote. Though there are complications associated with the spaces, their accessibility and positioning shifts through history, the, Cat the Catholic chapel is apparently much less ornate than it used to be. For my purposes, I simply want to highlight the changes that the new diversity has pro have prompted. In a space that formerly would never have seen an alternative to a chapel, there are now four spaces that attempt to meet the needs of this complicated new world. The staff and volunteers too are aware of the new diversity and the need to shift their practices in response. As one of our chaplains so succinctly put it, it's often the case that in one room there are four beds, four residents, four religions, and four languages. For the most part, we found our participants gen to be genuinely struggling to step outside of their own worldviews, which were predominantly Christian, to sort out how to best meet people's needs in a rapidly changing caregiving context. The healthcare setting is unique in that people are vulnerable and caregiver and receiver are enmeshed together in a highly intimate setting. There are unequal power relations, to be sure. The new, di new diversity is worked out between individuals in these instances, on the ground, but also by institutions and organizational policies. This makes for complicated business. The will to religion, particularly Christian religion, is strong and often invisible to those who are immersed in it. One interviewee describing nature in the garden said, and I quote, it's just nature, it's just beauty. You know, the way I've described nature is that nature takes you outside of yourself. It kind of points to a creator. So I think it gets people into that transcendent realm. It's just, it draws you to something beyond yourself, a life force that can create this kind of beauty, you know? End of quote. Laying the gloss of belief over those who share the garden space comes perilously close to universalizing a religious worldview. The universalizing tendencies of Christianity have been written about by Boyarin and Boyarin and others, and I won't expand on them here. This will to religion overrides the interpretations of those engaged in the activities themselves, sometimes feeling like a paternalizing and patronizing move. For the non-religious, a space may inspire awe without having any link to transcendence or a creator. Organizationally, there are subtle reinforcements of Christian hegemony. There's a Catholic priest who is paid by the hospital, multi-faith volunteers, and generic paid staff who are mostly Christian. There's a belief that the Christian spiritual care providers can care for everyone. Again, a sort of universal default position. Indigenous elders are on a stipend rather than a salaried position in the spiritual health department. Most recently, the issue of assisted death or dying has brought to the foreground the tensions between religion and healthcare, not only in religious hospitals, but in hospitals more widely as healthcare providers request exemptions prov from providing assistance in death. So this follows a Supreme Court of Canada ruling called Carter 
And Car in Carter, the Supreme Court essentially said that people should be able, especially people who are terminally ill, should be able to choose the time and place of their death. So we've turned, we've, we've um, shifted the law in Canada so we now accept assisted dying as a reality and as something that our healthcare system should be providing in certain circumstances. So the Supreme Court support, used the language of the sanctity of life. It's a kind of interesting decision if you're into legal decisions, and I happen to really like them, but um, not everyone finds them as exciting as I do. But they use this language of the sanctity of life and they flip it a bit. So they use sanctity of life to support the position that people who have a chronic Ill illness have the right to decide when and how to die. My position is that the Carter decision represents the court's move from a religious position or a religious stance on dying to one which is non-religious. Again, we see a mixed response to this new aspect, or to this aspect of the new diversity. On the one hand, some religious healthcare providers expe express respect for those who wish to access medically assisted dying. Though they themselves will not provide it, they will ensure, with, uh, they will ensure that their patients are connected to resources that allow them to have that option. On the other hand, some religious healthcare providers express the view that people in such positions just don't understand dying, are afraid of pain when they don't need to be, and if only they understood the process better, they would not want to access medically assisted death. Here again, we see a subtle I know better approach that imposes a religiously motivated position about death and dying on everyone. So while the, the prayer project has encouraging evidence of responses to a new diversity that would facilitate living well together, there are also traces of resistance, a will to religion that imposes a logic and practice of majoritarian religion on those who do not share that, do not share that worldview. The second healthcare example I want to turn to is from the province of Quebec. And that province has a peculiar uh, and particular history of Catholic dominance that is presently manifested in what someone has called a catho laic, in other words, a Catholic secular uh, manner. Again, we turn to a hospital for the story. So just about a year ago, February 2017, the crucifix in the Saint Sacrement Hospital in Quebec City which had hung in various locations in the hospital for about 90 years, was the focus of controversy when it was removed by the hospital board. There was an explosion of public conversation and discourse. Much of it opposed the removal of the crucifix. Someone, an unidentified patient of unnamed religious or non-religious pedigree, had complained about the crucifix. After discussing the matter thoroughly, taking into account the diversity of its patients, the fact that the hospital board, as they said, that people don't come to hospitals by choice, that they're there under um, the circumstances of their health care needs rather than wanting to spend time in the hospital, uh, consulting the provincial human rights guidelines, the, the hospital board then decided after these considerations to remove the crucifix. Christine Cusack is a PhD student I work with, and she and I have examined some 40 documents, newspaper articles, blogs, press releases, and website statements to analyze the public discourse about the Saint-Sacrement incident. The language of those who objected to the removal of the crucifix in the brouhaha that ensued was dominated by words like culture and heritage. And just a piece of information that I realized you might not know about Canadian healthcare context, that is when I say Catholic hospitals, those are not hospitals that are not publicly funded. Those hospitals are publicly funded, but because of histor essentially historical residue, um, they continue to uh, frame themselves within the uh, the. I suppose the identity of a Catholic hospital. So just, I, it occurred to me that you might need to know that. So the language of those who objected to the removal of the crucifix in the brouhaha that ensued was dominated by words like culture and heritage. Hardly anyone spoke about religion. Rather than defend the crucifix drawing on its religious qualifications, the public debate and discussion focused almost entirely on culture, heritage, and the meaning of the neutrality of the state. Mention of religion was incidental. A petition to reinstate the crucifix circulated on Facebook, and that petition said, moreover, and this is a quote, in the current context of respecting the religions that settle in Quebec, some feel that the traditions of long-established people are being questioned. 
All religions must be respected, and the Christian religion is one of them. These people are entitled to demand respect for their culture, traditions, and religion, even if it is purely a patrimonial one. The premier of the province, Philippe Couillard, weighed in, said, being open and tolerant does not mean erasing our heritage and history, which is how he read the removal of the crucifix, as an erasure of heritage and history. A conservative Catholic group, Mouvement Tradition Québec, said, we are in our country. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Some comments were less subtle, if you can call that one subtle. Um, for better or for worse, in our world, religions, in our world, religious identities are resurging. Reminding of the importance of the crucifix in these circumstances is to remind immigrants that they're here in the Occident and that Christianity is not one religion among others. It's that which formed our civilization. Everyone must accept this." End of quote. A somewhat shadowy other presented in the public discourse, shifting attention away from the non-religious who have been, frankly, the dominant drivers in challenges to religious symbols and practices in the public sphere. In the peti petition I've mentioned, the Facebook petition, long-established people who are Christian are juxtaposed against in the current context of respecting the religions that settle in Quebec. So there are the newcomers, and then there are the, the uh, long-established, and there's a word, the phrase Pierre is used um, to describe this group of originating people who are uh, uh, more privileged, I suppose, is a way to put it. In Quebec, as elsewhere, the precise contours of this what this respect uh, entails, this respect for the settler, um, these are under intense negotiation, often framed in terms of accommodation and tolerance. A more pointed statement, if we can get more pointed, named the other. Quote, in Quebec, a doctor or nurse can wear the hijab or even the niqab at work, thus imposing its religious signs on patients who have no say, while a single complaint was enough to tear the crucifix off a wall where it had been for 90 years. Why, why such a double standard, this person wrote. And then there were comments in, the support, in support of the removal of the crucifix. This one is from the Friendly Atheist blog. Uh, this person says, there's precedence for what the hospital did. In fact, there's a cross atop Montréal, uh, and both are considered historical relics of a more religious time, not endorsements of the faith. And if you've been to Montreal, you know there is a cross on the top of, we call it the mountain, um, which is a really a gross exaggeration. It's just like a hill, but anyhow, there is a cross that overlooks the entire city. If this person says, if, there, there are merely sim if they are merely symbols, then so be it. My concern is that these symbols are allowed to remain in place because government officials are willing to let Christianity get away with things no other religion can. That said, the patients are better off in a secular hospital with a Catholic symbol than a Catholic hospital that doesn't provide a full range of services. Now, just before they go in for surgery, patients will be able to see a dead man with bloody appendages. I'm sure they'll appreciate it, he said sarcastically. The crucifix was put back up a month after it was removed. The hospital had, in the interim, received credible threats, threats to their staff, threats of death to their staff, for the removal of the crucifix. But this time, when the crucifix went back up, it went up with a plaque. And the plaque explained its connection, the crucifix's connection, to the history of the hospital, which had been founded as a teaching hospital and run by the Sisters of Charity. So, so far, we have a new diversity that impacts on social institutions and day-to-day -day life. I focused on hospitals because I happen to be involved in two research projects that involve either hospitals or, in the example of the crucifix, the notion of religion to culture and majoritarian religion transforming itself into culture, um, how these things manifest in hospitals, also in municipal councils, other state ceremonies, and so on. There's also an interesting case that's come from the Supreme Court on prayer for municipal council meetings. It comes out of Quebec. Uh, Quebec is always a really interesting laboratory for these sorts of cases. But the interesting thing about that case was that when the Supreme Court decided that it's inappropriate to say prayers that look decidedly Christian before municipal council meetings, people all across Canada um, reacted. Uh, and it became apparent that, unbeknownst to many of us, many, many municipal council meetings were starting with Christian prayers. So. 
Social institutions and social actors are responding in various ways to this new diversity. Some, as we saw in the prayer project, with good intentions, respect, and a willingness to cede power and make reparations, as in the example of the First People's Space. On the other hand, we have resistances, a move to entrench majoritarian religious practices through the vehicle of culture and heritage. They have religion, we have culture. So, responding to this new diversity. In his essay, From Mirroring to World Making, Research as Future Forming, Kenneth Gergen argues that social scientists need to, quote, replace the captivating gaze on the world as it is with value-based explorations into what it could be. Building on Gergen's insight and thinking about examples I've talked about, I think we can identify two primary narratives. One is future forming and the other is past pres preserving. Following, and I don't want to imply that these are necessarily mutually exclusive. In other words, a future forming narrative doesn't mean that the past is erased or that there's no acknowledgement of the history, the culture, etc., of a place and people. So future forming and past preserving. Following Gergen and moving beyond the captivating gaze he criticizes, in a world characterized by a new diversity, it's the future forming narrative that embraces, I think, this new reality and which necessitates a revised power structure and reconfigured social relations that move horizontally rather than vertically. The goal is to live well together and the process is a world of becoming. And here I rely on political theorist, uh, American political theorist, William Conley. And I'm going to quote him just briefly. Um, the world of becoming in which it is, he says, imperative to negotiate new connections between non-theistic constituencies who care about the future of the earth and numerous devotees of diverse religious traditions who fold positive spiritualities into their creedal practices. So that's Conley. Give you a quick rundown, and here's the only place where I really wish I had a PowerPoint slide. Um, the two narratives, one past preserving, one future forming, and I'll give you some key points from both of those, and then we'll sort of get on to the deep equality piece of this. Um, under the past preserving model, social relations are vertical. The conceptualization of religion is becoming more described as culture and heritage, foundational tradition. The rhetoric is, again, foundational. This is our foundation. You have to accept that. You heard that in some of the comments uh, on the removal of the crucifix uh, in the San Sacramento Hospital. The future is pluralism, not diversity. It's intercultural, preserving a sort of um, place of authority for the founding peoples. Um, it is uh, intercultural. There are clear boundaries, and there's an us and a them. Equality is imagined as formal, and the words accommodation and tolerance dominate. Key words are values, universal, and immigrants should fit in. The impact of the presence of majoritarian symbols and practices is usually described as trivial, they harm no one, and no one has complained. The other is imagined as radical, draconian, hypersensitive, and different. The state, has an obligation to protect this heritage and culture um, at any expense. And the strategy is assimilation. The future forming model, social relations are horizontal. Conceptualization of religion is a new diversity. Majoritarian religion, which is in most of our cases Christianity, is one among many worldviews. It's legitimate, but it's one among many. Rhetoric is emergent and becoming, drawing again on Conley's work. The future is diverse, multicultural. That's not a very good word in many places these days. In Canada, we still, we're still starting to use it again. I think in Sweden a bit too. Um, the future is diverse, multicultural, or super diverse. Equality is imagined substantially, substantively, deeply, as textured and context specific. Key words are respect, context, and welcome. The impact of majoritarian symbols is significant harm to self and to others. The other is seen as belonging and is similar, and points of similarity are sought for. The state is neutral, and the strategy is inclusion, not assimilation. So those are, that's a kind of brief overview. I was hoping you could just imagine the chart that's in front of me. The narratives, these narratives, don't exist in pure form in day-to-day -day life, and nor can they be attributed to any one group. This is not a finger pointing exercise. Traces of them are evident in debates over religion in the public sphere. 
Moreover, social actors are complex. Interests, values, and commitments make for varied approaches and strategies. Elements of the narratives are linked and build on each other. For example, the success of the past preserving narrative is dependent on the reconfiguration of religion as culture and heritage. That serves as a foundation for state action. It justifies continued vertical social relations and configures a rationalized hierarchy in which freedom of religion is one of many rights, but from which culture is exempt. So in other words, the other is going to battle it out in the territory of freedom of religion, but culture is somehow separate and set aside and protected by the state. In examples of the hospitals, we see both of these models. I think predominant in the Va Vancouver example is probably the future forming, uh, in that what we saw in our research was that people are genuinely trying to think about how do we include people? How do we take into account all of these constituencies? Uh, and, not, and yes, it's, it is a hospital that describes itself as Catholic, um, but there is very much a commitment to understanding, responding to the new diversity. And the removal of the crucifix in saint sacrement I think, can also be understood as uh, dual. I mean, we see some residue in the Vancouver Hospital of the past preserving model, um, but in the removal of the crucifix example in Saint-Sacrement, we see the crucifix go back up but under different circumstances. And I'll talk about that again at the very end today. So the notion of deep equality is where I'm turning now. So how do we get there? How do we get to this place, this future forming model that's inclusive, that encourages accessibility for religious and non-religious people alike? I think there are, that in many ways we are already there. Um, I suppose that's the good news if you need some good news. Here's where I turn to this work I've been doing on the notion of deep equality. I think um, in thinking about religious diversity, I realized that the accommodation model, which folds in the concept of tolerance, was not re working really well. It preserves a hierarchy that maintains an us and a them position. How does it feel, to quote Anne Pellegrini and Janet Jacobson, how does it feel to be tolerated? Um, it preserves the hierarchy that ma maintains, as I said, an us-them position. I was also concerned about the dominance of law in managing diversity. Increasingly, law had voice, what some people describe as juridification. I was especially worried that equality has come to be understood as something that is located only in law's regime and that no one else had the right or the possibility of understanding or activating it. So as I worked with various data sets, I saw another aspect of equality, what I've described as deep equality, located in everyday interactions between people and local initiatives. The project of deep equality seeks to recover narratives of everyday working out of difference through small stories that exhibit agonistic respect, caring, reciprocity, and neighborliness. The point here is that we don't have to make up the how-to on this. People identify similarities with, yet, with each other or with others, not necessarily sameness or difference in their everyday encounters with each other. And I avoid the word sameness or difference. Sameness because I don't want to lapse into that tendency to universalize and difference because I don't want to overemphasize the ways in which people are different. They look for points of similarity. As social scientists, we're really good at focusing on problems. But in the context of this new diversity, we also need to be more attentive to those strategies and processes that work to facilitate inclusion and model living well together. I just wanted to check the time. So deep equality gets worked out at individual levels, group levels, and state levels. Um, the most difficult to, to study and trace, and the area that interests me the most, actually, is at the individual level, where we trace or look for micro-processes, small stories that add up to models for inclusion for the future. And these are, as I said, the most difficult to find, because they may be what I've called non-events things that people don't necessarily remember from their lives, ways of interacting with people that were inclusive, but they might not even reflect on, they just do. The second way are group, group ways. There are many initiatives that stay largely under the radar, local, specific, um, some that start that way and move outward. 
when I was looking for examples in Sweden, just so I could try to connect it to something that some of you might have uh, heard about and might be able to link to some of the stuff that I'm talking about, uh, I came across the example of Eba Ackerman, whose initiative in Stockholm to have people meet newcomers over dinner has kind of blossomed out and become rather popular. And she felt that this was a way to uh, start to make newcomers feel included and to connect them with people who have been here for a long time. Another example comes from Quebec, again. Uh, the Brossard soccer team is the story that I like to tell in this context. In that context, uh, the Quebec Soccer Federation at one point decided it was a very good idea to ban turbans on the soccer field. And so one of the soccer teams in just outside of Montreal, uh, the coach and the boys who played on, I forget, I think they were like 13 to 15 years old, decided that their way to resist this or to show solidarity with those boys who do play with a turban was to wear t turbans themselves, even though n not one of the people on the team was a Sikh. They went to the local Sikh community, they talked to them about this, they asked them, they interacted with them, asked them if it would be all right if they did this as a gesture of solidarity, um, learned more about why Sikhs wear turbans, and then went to uh, the, the ne their next game all wearing turbans um, with the support of and help of the local Sikh community. Um, and then the, the end part of that, and I did um, a discussion yesterday with some of you who, who were there, so I'm kind of repeating the same Brossard soccer team story, but when they go to play that day, the opposing coach looks at the, at the coach of the boys who are wearing the turbans and says, but this isn't a reason, this isn't what reasonable accommodation is supposed to be. And I think the story for me really illustrates all of the problems with the notion of reasonable accommodation, and that someone gets to say, who, what is reasonable, and who should be accommodated, and it never seems to be the minority um, religious group in particular. The state level, in the plans for the new hospital run by the Catholic Health Authority in Vancouver, because they're moving from their current location, the one that I was in, there's an even more impressive First People's space. It will be centrally located, at least in the plans that I saw, in the best space in the hospital in terms of view, and accessibility, and if you've been to Vancouver, you know it can be a really beautiful city. Uh, the last time I was there, um, there was a colleague from England, and he had been told there were mountains in Vancouver, and it was cloudy and foggy the whole time, and he doesn't, still doesn't believe that there are actually mountains in Vancouver, but there are. Um, at that same research team meeting, one of our team members from England, another one, asked why, given the small percentage of the population that make up indigenous peoples, such a prominent space is given to this effort. The hospital administrator who came to show us the plans uh, and to talk about what was planned and they hoped for in terms of spiritual care, explained that it was an important part of reconciliation for the Catholic Health Authority. This would be what I would call a gesture of deep equality. It's not about percentages and giving according to percentages. It's about trying to figure out who's been historically wronged and in Canada that certainly includes and probably is first and foremost indigenous peoples. We might also think about the solution of the Saint Sacrament Hospital. What does the hospital's solution to return the crucifix with ex this explanatory plaque achieve? If the goal is, in fact, to recognize the contribution of the Catholic sisters whose labor has sustained the hospital over many years, the plaque may accomplish that. By putting a crucifix without explanation on the wall, there's an assumption that everyone knows what it is and shares in its message. Linking it to the sisters, to culture and to heritage, and affirming the secular nature of hospitals may achieve the balance necessary to accomplish inclusion. It may create space for the person who says, but it is my culture and heritage, as long as she does not insist that it is the only version of culture and heritage to be told. And there are many people in Quebec who when you have this conversation with them will say, it is my culture and heritage, it's not religion. Um, it may include the atheist who sees no place for religion in public settings such as hospitals or council chambers, but who has no objection to acknowledging the contributions of diverse constituencies to the society in which she lives. And it may also include the person whose daily or occasional religious practice includes the crucifix, so long as he does not insist on observance by everyone. 
There are many who defy these categories too. The atheist who doesn't care about religious symbols in public places and the religious person who objects to religion's colonization of public space. And again, to come back to the indigenous peoples of Canada, many of them have a very complex relationship with Catholicism in that they might describe themselves as both practicing indigenous spiritualities and Catholicism. Everyone, or pardon me, eraser of symbols can alienate, hurt, and create irreparable divisions. So too can inhabiting the, the inhabiting of public space by symbols that serve as a reminder of exclusion and non-belonging. This is the challenge of inclusion presented by the complex future we face, and one in which we need, to, we need models for living well together in the new diversity. That model will include, first, an acknowledgement of power and the vitality of the power and vitality of symbols, and the need to contextualize them to create inclusive spaces. Second, a recognition that an absence of complaint does not equal inclusion. Vulnerable people sometimes feel that the cost is too high to object, so they just stay silent. Third, a willingness to relinquish rightness and power by those who are accustomed to having it, and not to try to describe themselves as victim because they're losing a bit of power. Fourth, an examination and further mobilization of the positive contribution of the constituent, constituent parts of new diversity. This is what the new di diversity prevents for presents for us in terms of living well together in the future. Thank you.